Uh, <clears throat> I have to start saying that <clears throat> my major training as, um, I suppose, as an architect, as a man, was not at the Polytechnical, but was in Africa. I was there for my youth. I was in Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea. And uh, the teacher there for the secondary school, high school, they were really the beginning of my proper education. Philosophy, mathematics and so on, that is, was my origin. Arriving in, uh, in Milano in '47, after the, the war, the Milano was completely destroyed by bombing and was a very sorrow city. Slowly it became um, with a new era of uh, social or socialist approach. Milano University and, uh, and the Polytechnico had quite a few good teachers, but to you know to be frank, I mean I, that was not my major source of information and planning and inf influence on my way of thinking about architecture. That was coming from mostly from one man that was Pierlu no, two of them, Pierluigi Nervi, an engineer. And uh, the idea of architecture became quite clear. And even today, I believe that everyone is, is totally wrong when is they're talking about architecture. Right? Architecture is, is, the inside, is the private place of any building, not the external place of the building. The external place of the building is belonging to urban design. Urban design, landscape design, call it whatever, but it's not really related to the, to the volume of, to the space, to the void that you create in architecture. The Polytechnic was good, yes. Was good mostly for a revolutionary um, idea of the world, which was closer to communist than to liberal. And um, in, so that's. That was the, the power of the Polytechnic as instruction to me. I, I had a lot more connection with artists than with architects. Uh, even then, the, you know, the Polytechnic was um, following the Bauhaus. And I believe that the, the Bauhaus was a sort of a, almost a fascist institution. That, you know, is, was the modern movement of the Bauhaus was the fact that if you design something, is pre the function is the most important thing that you can follow. My feeling was not that the function, the actual function, was not was not architecture, was purely technicality. My feeling is that if you don't have a, a poetry within the architecture, then you don't create architecture. Now, your question was um, my connection. All right, I was involved uh, that the 50, 50, 1952, 53, say a few months before I had my degree, or that was in 53, I was with my 
future wife in, um, in France. And I had a, a 10 days with Le Corbusier uh, at, the, at Marseille, the Unité d'Habitation. From there, I was invited by a professor of mine to be part of the Triennale in Milano. That is a, the most known um, exhibition of architecture and art. There, I met Lucio Fontana and uh, Tapio Vircala. The Finn, that they become, we became quite, quite friends, and um, and that was my connection. I mean, I never liked any other architect. Put it that way. And at that time, really, the you know the the approach to architecture of the Polytechnic was too close to to be Bauhaus. You know, function, 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 function. I mean, in, um, in, uh, in Milano, there was not really the, the interest that time was not in, on, um, on experimenting. It was purely on, on feeling and, and reaction to a type of a type of instruction. Right? My position was as as a reaction. I mean, at that time, uh, the one person was architect uh, was um, in Rome, and Pierluigi Nervi, the uh, the engineer, was in Rome, and they were coming to the Polytechnic to to do lectures and so on. And they were the most influential to me. Again, I didn't agree with Pierluigi Nervi in relation to, again, um, the fact that if you produce architecture that is totally controlled and totally taught, he said you had only one solution. You cannot have three solutions, four solutions. One solution. If you're right, it's one solution. And I didn't, I couldn't possibly accept that. I thought that every mistake that he made was good, better than the one that was right. At that time, uh, I was invited to be the a young architect, just a few months after my degree, at the Triennale of Milano, in charge of foreign entry. It's an international exhibition area. And therefore I met Le Corbusier, I knew before, I met Neutra, I met um, Alvar Alto uh, and Lucio Fontana, and so I was there in the middle of the big master of, uni of architecture. That's it. It was not the Polytechnic, it was the, was the Triennale. Now, one day I had a call from the director of the Triennale, and he, that he had a, a call from Australia, from Sir Charles Lloyd Jones, David Jones' boss at that time, and he wanted to organize an exhibition in Sydney, that was 55, <coughs> with all the, you know, new design produced in Italy. So it was called Italy and David Jones. And um, he asked for an architect in actual fact he suggested Joe Ponti being the architect, but the director said, Oh, I'll have a younger architect. You know, that's pure luck. And he said, oh, I have someone that should do the job. And he mentioned me. Therefore I 
they, they came to Milano, they talked with me, they explained what they wanted, I, do the, I prepared the, the design for the exhibition in Sydney and we, with my wife, we came to Sydney in, in I think it was June or in July of 55 for the exhibition to stay for six weeks. Now, I stayed for six months because I wanted to see the other part of Australia. And coming to Canberra at that time, I said, that one is, that one is my place. Mm -hmm. uh, not because the future could have been good for building, but because it was, I would say, completely, completely a void, you know, completely no history, nothing. Right? Except magnificent sky at night and, and you know, Brindabella covered with snow and um, social life uh, that where everyone knew each other after few weeks that I stay here. So we decided that most probably that would be, I decided, unfortunately, my wife was not totally convinced, but she accepted it and we stayed here. So we went back, closed shop in Italy and come back here. Now, we arrived in Canberra with a visiting Canberra as a, as a new capital. And uh, we arrived here and uh, by car in a quite a pleasant trip. Uh, Canberra at that time had 30,000 people. No, yes, around, around 30,000 people. Uh, Canberra was really what Canberra should have been, you know, was not, was not the Australian capital territory, which is quite a large area of, but was Manuka, um, Griffith here, where we say, and Civic, with no lake, uh, and um, a lot of incredible uh, bunch of people living here where they were all practically pioneer, pioneer. So, and among them there were two um, Nobel laureate, just, you know, as to say so. And we arrived here, we stayed at Canberra Hotel for a while and then we went to University House, where the master of University House was uh, someone that knew fa my father in um, in Italy, and he was a, a, a Triscology uh, professor. And uh, we stayed at the University House for a couple of months before returning to that. Now, Canberra was an empty place, physically, very few trees, no vegetation to, 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 to be funny about. Because the, at, the, at the time when you had a, a new block and a house, they would offer you for gratis uh, trees that you could choose and put down and look after, etc., etc., etc. So that is how. The green in Canberra is totally, it's not, a, it's not original, right? It's been planted everywhere. Uh, the lake was not there, so we were playing golf on the lake, what, what is the lake now? But at the same time was um, totally international, not completely uh, populated by by embassy, because there were only three or four, five of them here. But, you know, you could speak Italian if you wanted, you could speak 
French, you could speak German if you knew it. Uh, and, um, you know, we finally, you know, you, you met, you know, a Nobel laureate, the prime minister was quite available, you know, you were on the, the diplomat, they were quite available. Everyone was looking for creating a, a little uh, entourage, put it that way. And that was an incredible position from anywhere in the world. And that was very strong influence for us to stay here. First of all, the, say, the Italian ambassador, together with a lot of others, they were all in Sydney. The, the embassy, they were, oh, they rented and they had an office in Sydney, 90% of them, 10% they were in no, eighty percent was in Sydney, were in Sydney, five percent was were in Melbourne, and five percent they were in Canberra. The Italian ambassador asked me in Sydney when was the exhibition there. Uh, said I will be forced to go to Mel to Canberra because the Prime Minister Bob Menzies won't everyone to be there or else. And uh, can you look for a place for the embassy? So really, that was my beginning and said, oh, look, I could be involved with the designing of an embassy. And so I looked for the, for the site, I produced all the things that it needed to do and they came to Canberra and, uh, and that are my initial things was in a position that I had the possibility of starting my, my business here, my profession here, with the view of a very large and important construction. So I opened a, a small office in um, Civic, and again, on that period, I met few people, you know, at a certain level of, of entrepreneur and pioneer. And so they start asking me, oh, oh Eric, what about if you do that and that? And I started my professional life here really quite quite easily. That the Institute of Architect didn't want to, to accept me as, as an architect. That's a little story there. Um, the, the, I asked them, what can I do to be part of the Institute? And they said, oh, that's very simple. You go to university, you do your five years of university, and that's it. And I said, ah, oh, you know, that's not good. But uh, the fact that they were protecting only the name of architect, and the fact that in, I, I knew because of the previous question, the Italian embassy and so on, the head of the of the Department of Interior, and I said, "What can I do?" And he said, "Oh, Enrico, let's let me think about it." And called me and said, "All right, I have organized a, a meeting with the chief architect of the department, the planner, the engineer, and uh, the, the top position of the institute." In Canberra, it was at that time was not was not official, and we had an interview. Uh, we discussed it for a couple of hours, and the day after he called me, he said, "Right, you are registered." 
not with the institute, but registered with the Australian Capital Territory Architectural Board. And uh, said the only thing you cannot use is the word architect. And I said, oh, that's, that's no problem. And all my projects, they were signed architecto. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah, you know, a few years later they asked me to say, oh, look, we are a bit embarrassed. So the fact that you do all that work and so on, and, but would you ask us again? And I said, all right. So I asked them again and they registered me. But in Canberra, as a registration of the architect, I am number 14. And from 1 to 13, they are not with us any longer. The idea of modern architecture has been always that previously architecture was classic architecture. Classic, I mean, architecture that had a codification, therefore you were designing under certain control that uh, were obliterated by the modern thinking. And the modern thinking uh, has, was based on two major issues. One, that the history, influence, should not be there. Because if you, if you want to create something that is new, and what I always say that architecture should be full of wonder, right? and it's for you visiting architecture that you should be questioning the architecture itself and say, but why that? And because you wonder about whatever you, you feel. So in that respect, architecture should be wonderful, right? Full of wonder. Not beautiful, not ugly, because it's purely something that is only for personal feeling and it should to do that should not try at least to not to be produced before therefore to do that you must be in a void you should erase from your memory everything that it was done before and see if you can do something different that's what i'm saying Void is the only situation to begin with. It's, you know, it's inventing the wheel again. But take a bit of time, take a bit of difficulty in achieving that position, but that is my idea of starting any design. Canberra was in actual fact ideal because did not have the influence of history, or very little and not very good, but so you were not influenced by the fact that before you, someone did something magnificent, and so you should really follow him to a certain extent, or use him as, as a, a master. And camera was perfect, total void, uh, fantastic light, uh, this silence that was like music. You know, you go coming from Europe. You every time you want to design something, they said, "Oh no, but you cannot do that because one thing and another because someone there have left some some ruin from two thousand years ago. You cannot touch them. All sort of things." And you are really op op oppressed by, the, by that. I was. 
And so arriving here and say, oh, everyone is, everything is, is clear, is tabula rasa, was fant- fascinating. And that's what I was saying, that Canberra was the ideal place to be. Because you could reach that position of, um, of, of non-memory uh, a lot easier than any other way in the world. Now, modern, modern material, there are, there are few, and uh, a concrete is not one of them either. But <coughs> uh, generally speaking, with the, with the teaching of university or something, it seems that material has become more important than, call it shape, volume. Uh, and it seems to me that Akhreb tend to say, oh, I'm using concrete and therefore I design for concrete, uh, or I'm using glass and then I design for glass, I'm using steel, so I design for steel. That's not my approach to architecture. I say I design for voids and and volumes, and then I said, oh, what will be the best material to use to fill that void, to put a shape to that void? And if you're looking at material in that view, in that way, then uh, the most plastic, the most uh, adaptable material is concrete. Concrete is a plastic material, uh, which then becomes rigid, but before you can give them any shape and any form that you want. While you cannot do that with timber, or we don't, cannot do that with glass, or at least very difficult to do it, or bricks. Therefore, my preferred material, it becomes not because I'm choosing concrete before, but because if I want to do something with a good plasticity, a good um, volume and so on, concrete is more expensive, but it's the best material. That doesn't mean that uh, I will not use timber. I mean, really, uh, in say in this house, and even in the house that we will discuss after, of the Dingle House, uh, there are, if, if you have to follow a certain pattern and you say, you I have to use, you know, I, I cannot use concrete or I cannot use too much glass, so you're starting, having designing um, voids that they have a certain a l- more rigidity, like you know verticality, uh, horizontality and etc, which then they can be used, they can be uh, obtained with timber or with with brickwork or with steel. Sometimes you have uh, uh, external forces like uh, like you're building on top of a rock or building on top of a mountain or with a very steep uh, cutting and therefore you need anchorage, that you, you need anchorage because you want to do something but you're worried about falling somewhere there, then automatically you will create a possibility, no, a, a need to use steel. So the material is used in relation to the design that you're doing. You're not doing the design because you want to use a certain material. You should imagine for a moment that 
uh, any house, uh, any building has an interior and an exterior, right? That what I was saying before, the interior is the real architecture, the exterior is public, right? So if it's in, in a city con uh, context, uh, you have urban design. If you are in a landscape, you have the landscape that to a certain extent will dictate certain parameter for your design. Dingo House, uh, first of all, uh, is on a, on a road, it's a cul-de-sac, and is facing the golf course, right? So imagine that one. All the, the previous few houses on that street, they were facing the street. That is an old-fashioned uh, design. Everywhere in Canberra before, was following that and everyone in the world. You have a street and the street did decide the position of the house. In here, I said, look, you have at the back a park, a natural park. Uh, and you have a view and the orientation that is pointing in one direction that was toward the, toward the golf course. Surely, no houses should face the street. So, I, first of all, my position of the plan was to turn the 90 degrees, say, against the street. Right. So, that was the first one. Then, there was a, a, a land was not horizontal, or it was added. So, I said there should be two level uh, on that house, one for the two level or perhaps even three levels, because then I can uh, obtain view that they will be more suitable for the inside of the house. Let's talk to clients in general. Everyone, or when I had a client, every client that I had um, was submitted to a certain number of questions um, that I so Why are you wanting me to design a house for you? Right? So I wanted to know was a did he or she knew my work, really, and said, and what? So, and if they were saying, oh, you know, I, I asked someone and so on, etc., before you're making your decision, go and look at a few places. So we start having a, a, a reference between, you know, between between what you expect and what I would like you to have. The second uh, moment of that um, of that engagement was to you know have some information about their life. I remember once in, in a house that became quite good, I asked. Um, to the, the, the two and said, oh, to the husband, I said, oh, tell me, do you love your, like, love your wife? And he was totally shocked and I said, oh, don't worry about it. I mean, I want to know because, you know, I want to know what is the situation in the family. Or, you know, it, it uh, then asked, or do you like music or you like reading? So you have that information that is based for the way of approaching the design. So that client uh, at the Dingle House, they were friend 
of friend friend of someone that was with they were younger than me or not much the same age but friends of of someone that i knew etc and they, so the position was that they really didn't know what to expect and we start and this, we started uh, discussing things and he was using the and he was in the foreign affairs so the house was built and then it could have been rented and so on so we i had that that difficulty in in, uh, in making total decision but also i i he was com- i've been able to convince them that the volume of that house and remember that it's a small house in in, in relation is 1950 60 house houses they were quite limited in um, in costs it was a magnificent time to design houses but you had to be very strict with with cost right? and um but i said the the volume of that house uh would have been improved enormously if you had no division barrier right so the the three level or at least the two two of the three level they were connected completely visually connected therefore the this small area they were not small any longer because they had they had participation with the other volume and that is the is the dingle house light let's talk about light light is the major element on any building and it's not a question of light only it's a question of shade right so do you know do you, do you know at what speed are we moving at this moment in the universe do you okay we're moving in the universe at 300,000 km an hour right i mean it's frightening but we took 24 hour to go around on the axis and that is where we pick up our light right now it means that this room here is never the same at any time never because you have the sun out that can penetrate in the morning it may come through at that point and not at the other then the sun is not there because it's shadows of or clouds so the if you consider that the light is the most dynamic um material in any building dingle house is not different from the other the effect more than to to connect with the light is to see what the shadow of that light will be at midday or at 1 o'clock in the afternoon and the evening and try to block something that may be detrimental to the volume then uh, or a lot or increase the opening in certain area so it's not that you want the full light you can have small opening that they are as good or even better than large opening and that is in relation to the vegetation that you have out the trees and so on and uh, dingle house was based on on two section not the street one as very little opening uh 
because really the light from there is not really the good one. And, and on toward the park, there's a lot more opening because really the, the shadow produced a lot more exciting. The design, I don't think that there was a great deal of vegetation where the house is, is now. And, uh, but the vegetation of the park obviously was there, not as it is now, but was a lot smaller. Vegetation is something that, um, yeah, so I used that one. But uh, apart from that, in, you know the we're talking about vegetation and trees. It was a, a joke, um, which was usually said that you know, you know, medical doctor, when they made a mistake, they buried him. Oh, she. The architect, when they make a mistake, they grow a tree in front of it, and that is most probably quite right. So vegetation is part of is part of the landscape, and uh, Canberra is really uh, a landscape city. That, and the, but the landscape is not a natural, automatic system. It's something that you have to create. You know, the client, the people living, and so on. They create their own their own vegetation. And and you have to accept it. You cannot stop it, so yeah, yes, yes, always. I mean really remember that uh client are as important or in designing the house as the architect. It's not, you know, the architect try to to involve the client, the client try to involve the architect, uh, the client has certain idea and the architect has something else, but really at the end uh, the, the client is part of design, you know, he is part of design and he is the, the one who makes architecture in life. Now, every house that most probably you have in mind, one uh, was Evans House, the other one was um, P uh, Patterson House, you know, but they are responding to do different uh, existing landscape position. So the courtyard is is part of the house when you can do it. Sometimes you can't, but and you try to create it and that will be a good example will be the Patterson. Uh, the fact that if you are on a slope side and, and a difficult to approach would be would be the Evans house, called Evans, somebody else is there now, but where really you had to to build the house at the level that you could have the view, the light, the sun, etc. And so you have to build something that is almost part of the landscape as a support of the house. And that's what's happening. Remember that design is, is not something that, uh, that is easy to explain. You know, you, you dare and you think something and you say, all right, we do it, oh, it's, it's crazy, so what? In actual fact, if the client is happy, I'm happy, that is how the design is coming. So,
Yes. No. If you <coughs> if you consider that the inside of the house is the real architecture, right? The everything that is involving uh, that design, and that includes the kitchen and the bathroom and the and the living room and and the bedroom, are part of the same concept of unity. So yes, I designing the, the the fixture, right? Remember that everyone, um, you know, you have fixture in a, in a in a house, and you have furniture, which is mobile, put it that way. Now, I never went to the extent of design the furniture to a house, but everything, but I try to put always as much as I can as a fixture in the house, because then it will be part of the volume, and it will be there all the time. Right? Well, a table can be moved, something which is fixed cannot, therefore is part, become part of permanent volume that will have to receive light and create shade as much as a window. So I, yes, I go to that level all the time. I am a modest man, so I think that my influence in the city is not good enough. Should be more. But uh, no, I you know, every time you design something, and remember that the major work came from the National Capital Authority, the National Capital Development Commission, uh, uh, is uh, is important to me. I hoped really, and I'm not joking now, that my influence could have been a bit stronger in some point of Canberra, and really that will be urban design. Uh, the fact that my major buildings are not on an urban situation has reduced to a certain extent the impact. Right? If there were in the centre of the city and so on, could have had more impact. There are few, but then they really had. Uh, it's, um, no, it's quite, quite clear that the influence and the... Look, when you are young and you are an architect and, you know, like John Matteo, and and you start with enormous desire of, of changing the world, and then slowly you realize that the world is going in a different direction than what you would have liked. Uh, it's taking a lot of time to accept it, right? So you are always happy for what you achieved, and very unhappy of what it could have been achieved. I mean, I would, I would be saying if something wrong if I said I, I couldn't care less, because obviously, I mean, you have a recognition from, you know, being the the one architect in Australia as the best uh, achiever or achiever of um, influence within the architecture, obviously I am proud of it. At the same time, you know, you have always the, the negative part that is positive in certain extent that says, yes, but It's really true that I I created something that will be permanent, right? and uh, and really is purely 
a pleasure or a honor that you have and you're happy about it, but the actual value in relation of dreams is neither one is one or another. I mean, you know, you have your own dreams and your dreams are not not, not getting fruition. You know, I dream about Canberra in a certain way, but government and, and department and architects, they all seem to look to, you know, to, to produce some return of money instead of looking at the big picture. So that is a bit... Looking back at the Dingle house, I'm quite happy. I mean, that house is still, is still functioning and, and being appreciated by the, by the user, which are not the original client, but by the user. Uh, and, uh, and that is what makes me very happy. It's uh, you no know, architect going around, and if you have someone living or using a building, like any building, and uh, being unhappy in it, that is the time that you feel sorry, and you feel like, say, don't go near that building until somebody else is using and is happy because architecture is produced by the user and not by the architect at the end. You know, an unhappy person in one of my buildings make my building unhappy, right? So that is how I'm looking at Tinkle House. It's good because I hope she's still as happy as before, you know, her husband died of the Dingham house. So really, it's a situation where before they were too happy in that house. Now I'm not so sure that... Uh, I hope she's still happy, but, you know, in a totally different situation. So yeah. I hope the house will help her bypass that moment of despair when a loved one dies. I mean, mostly something that you live together for a large part of your life.